Scott. Yeah. So let's, let me ask you, who is William Lee Scott? Well, I am. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I'm a father. I'm an artist. You know? I'm a man. What is the definition of a man to you? I mean, I don't know. That seems like uh, cloudy waters today's times. So I don't really like to define that. I don't, I, don't, I don't really get to make the decision on the definition of that. I, I can define what I think I am, what I bring to the table, you know, but I don't know what the definition of a man is right now. The country's changed so much. The world's changed so much. Wow. Yeah. As a father, I feel like I have more in common with my father and my father-in-law than I do with um, young fathers right now because maybe they experienced some of the technology changes and this and that. I mean, but as a, f as a father now, I have more in common with generations over the last 50 years because right. I was raised like they were without all this technology. I just, and I was also raised in a very rural environment. So I, I even when technology presented itself, I, I it wasn't available, you know? Right. Yeah. What were, um, first of all, like, where were you born and raised? Um, I was born in Hudson, New York, which is like about two and a half hours north of Manhattan on the uh, east side of the Hudson River. And I was raised in a very small farming community in uh, Red Rock, which is about 30 minutes outside of Hudson, maybe like 10 miles from the nearest store. Okay. A few other farms and houses in our little community, but no, no stores, just, just about seven or eight families that lived in this small valley in upstate New York. All right. Yeah. Did your family have any ties into the entertainment industry? Um, no, not really. I mean, my, my dad's funny. You know, everyone in my family's very funny. Pretty funny. Mm -hmm. But no, no, no. Well, no, that's not true. My uncle was an, uh, a writer. So I guess that'd be considered the entertainment business. Very, he was a very successful uh, fly fishing writer. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So he wrote about like fly fish. He wrote uh, a, a few books about how to tie dry flies and fish on, uh, you know, dry fly, East Coast dry fly rivers. Yeah. yeah. So, at what point does a young man that's growing up, growing up in this rural town or community say that they want to go to Hollywood and make movies and do cool stuff? There was one movie theater in our in this like little town that was about seven, or like I said, seven to ten miles from my town, and I'd go to the movies and like be like, "How does that happen?" I didn't even think that that's real, so I never considered that to be some sort of profession or any sort of occupation whatsoever. I just thought it was like magic, like how do they even do that? Okay. And so, I mean, you just don't really consider. It. I just didn't know that you could do that really, so I didn't really think about being an actor. I did. I was very. Um, uh, involved in theater in my school as a okay. child, as a kid, all the way through high school. So when I got out of high school and I graduated from high school, I mean, I kind of knew exactly what I was going to do. I didn't know I was going to go to Hollywood because, like I said, I didn't even know how. I didn't know like I didn't know how films were made. Right. Was there a specific teacher? Because a lot of times yeah. we hear stories. And Two. Teacher. My basketball coach Brian McDonald. He was also my Irish literature teacher in high school, and he was just a very impactful person. I mean, I think I learned a lot about, I think I learned a lot about how to be a good actor by watching him. He was such, such a solid and he had a tremendous conviction about everything that he did as a coach, as a teacher. He just took things very seriously. And then I had a music, music and arts teacher, Arnold Logan, who was absolutely a genius. And I, I don't really know how to describe him. Um, He's, he's just really a special, special man who had a tremendous inf impact on As a, like, seventh and eighth grader, he, like, I came from the public school to this small art school, mm -hmm. and he plucked me out, and I had never sung before or never performed. I'd never been in front of an audience, and he sort of, I guess I had a personality that he was drawn to, and he was like, no, we're going to, you're going to, we're going to figure out how you're going to be comfortable doing this. And so at probably 14, I started to get on stage, and then, by the time I was a senior in high school, I was very comfortable on stage. So the next move was to go to move to graduate from high school. It was like, you know, when we were when I was a kid, it was like you you graduate from high school and you move to Manhattan 
and or you I mean if, if you want to be an actor you move to Manhattan and become an actor or you'd go to college or you'd go work for a construction company I mean those were sort of like the three that was my three options right. going to college wasn't I mean I got into college but I just really wasn't you know straight out of high school academics was not like it just didn't seem like the right path for me. Did, so how did your, your parents respond to this as this stuff is happening? You're doing this play, were they supportive of your, of your play? Yeah, my, my parents were supportive. My mom was a, a, a teacher and uh, my father was uh, a real estate broker and a justice of the peace and just a very pretty serious guy when it came to like my time and his time. So when I was getting out of high school and I did not have very good grades, and I did not really apply to what he thought were colleges that I should have been applying to. He, uh, he just was, it just didn't seem like they really wanted that. Not, and that, I don't mean this is not some sort of criticism over what, uh, they're just, what I felt they thought about me, but I just didn't get the sensation that they were all too interested in throwing down all this money right. for me to go to college and have no clue what I was studying, right. no idea, no direction, no, no, didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah, so. <laughs> I think my dad was pretty happy when I decided that I didn't want to go to college. Yeah. Save some money. But my dad's a tough dude. I mean, he did this, whether he wants to refute this or not, I mean, refute this or not. When I was 18, when I graduated from high school, my dad, I said I wanted to go to New York City. He said, you've got two weeks to get a job in an apartment or you got to join the Marine Corps. Mm. That was it. So. And what happened in those two I got a job and an apartment in like an hour. I mean, like, I mean, I got on the train. No, and it's not that I respect the U.S. Marine Corps more than it so much, but I just wasn't. Not only was I not college material, but I wasn't Marine Corps material at 18 either. Though they would have, maybe they could have turned me into a Marine, but I don't think that they could have at the time. Right. But uh, no, so uh, I didn't do that. Um, I went to the city and I rented a room at this uh, old lady's apartment on 116th Street and Broadway, and I started uh, taking takeout orders at a at a bagel, bagel place, a, a Jewish delicatessen, a bagel shop, and in, in, on like I think it was like Twenty First Street and Sixth Avenue, just sort of just was like, kind of get, getting out of the house, getting, getting in my own place, getting in my own space. And New York City in 1993 was a completely different. You know, it's a very, it was like, an, it was just a very different place. Was it an easy transition? Going from a tiny little farming community to like Manhattan, yeah, it was it was awesome though. I, I really loved it. New York City is truly like it, it really is that heartbeat. I mean, and just, you can't people people understand it that live there. I mean, it just it does something to you. You get all fired up, you know. You feel like feel like you can you can you feel like you can accomplish something really big. You know, that's the feeling I got. I was like, you know what. This is a cool place. You know, this, the energy was intense. You know, I was 18, 19, working in a restaurant with like a bunch of people that were 25, and they seemed like they were so old to me at the time. <laughs> like they were so, they were so like so much smarter and wiser, and they, you know. So I kind of followed in their footsteps. What was your typical night of just like hanging out in New York? Skateboarding at Columbia University with like a couple of students that I had met that were studying at Columbia, probably. Maybe like trying to get some bears, mm -hmm. kicking it on the stoop, maybe mm -hmm. smoking, a, <laughs> smoking some weed. I mean, who knows? <laughs> you know, like that was, you know, just sort of hanging out. You know, sort of getting getting used to being in the city. I didn't go anywhere. I didn't. I didn't really know anybody. I mean, I really just sort of slowly got accustomed to being in Manhattan, which is not the. You know, some people don't get. A, some people can't deal with it. Some people right. don't. They don't get it. They can they can never get accustomed to it. Did you uh, go on auditions? No, I wasn't even. I didn't even think about acting at the time. I mean, it was just I was so overwhelmed by being in Manhattan that I, I didn't even didn't even think about it. It hadn't even really crossed my mind. And then maybe after about six months, mm -hmm. I, I lost the job. I, I quit the job that I was working at at the delicatessen to to go work in a non for profit drug rehabilitation center okay. in, in like an office doing doing like reference program planning and reference work trying to secure funding for these for the institutions I was working for. It was my buddy's father and he was like, come work for me. And I got it. And I did. I went and worked in an office for six months and he literally, he, he, he calls me and said, Willie, you're fired. <laughs> like, it's like, 
you may be the worst office employee that I've ever seen in my life. So I got canned from that job. And then I went and uh, it was like Christmas time. So I sold fancy dress shirts on Madison Avenue. But that job lasted less than the other job that I had. I just I wasn't very good at selling shirts either. I mean, the, the boss just said, you seem so nice when you, when you first came in. And not, not, not that I was, but like, you're, you're useless at this. It's like, you're terrible. It's like, so, so at what point did we, does the spark go off that those movies that you were watching, I might have an actual shot of getting into that? Well, I, I lost that job. And then the guy that was working, the guy was managing me at the delicatessen, got my number from someone and called me up and was working at this new kind of hip and chic, chic restaurant in, uh, in Soho. And he was like, do you want to come do what you were doing at the, at the other spot here? I was like, hell yeah, that sounds awesome. Because I liked the restaurant work. It was good for me. And uh, so I went down to Soho and it was like, I, got to, I really started to see what New York was all about. I mean, the, the, the artist aspect of New York, like the cool people, the, the hip people, what they, what they were doing, what they were eating, where they were going. I wanted to hang out with, I was like, all right. Now I see what I'm, what I'm, so I started to do this thing where I was waiting tables in Manhattan where tourists would come in and they would, uh, they'd be from wherever they be, wherever they were from. Right. I'd be like, well, where are you guys from? And they'd be like, oh, we're from Tallahassee. I was like, well, my family's from Tallahassee. And I would just start, I'd put on an accent and I just started getting these big tips, just like, just sort of playing parts. And so a woman came in and I started serving her on a regular basis. She would come in like for lunch maybe once every two weeks. One day she comes up to me, she goes, you an actor? And I go, no. She goes, do you want to be? I go, yeah, I'd love to be. She goes, I see what you do. I see what you do with these people from all these different places that you just sort of change and morph and be what you think they want you to be like at the drop of a hat. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of my thing here. I just like, I make a pretty good living doing that. <laughs> and she goes, she goes, she goes, well, do you want to be an actor? I said, yeah. I go, where, where, where do I start? She's like, you got to go to school. So I went to the William Esper Acting Studio on 23rd Street. And, uh, and that's where I, I met the third teacher, Barbara Marchand. And she really affected me and impacted me. And I studied there for two years in the um, William Esper program, the Meisner program, and I, I kind of honed my skills pretty, pretty well. I mean, I really took the studies very seriously. And I did an audition, and after the two-year program, I went back to this manager and said, hey, well, I went to school. She goes, oh, okay. She goes, do you have a headshot? I go, no. She goes, all right, well, go to this place. She gets, sends me to get a headshot. She comes in, she looks, she's like, this is pretty good. She goes, I go, yeah, it's all right. She goes, I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna call a friend of mine, I'm gonna send you on an audition. I go, all right, we'll go on an audition, see what this is all about. So I go, it's a Frosted Flakes commercial. I don't have to say anything, I just, just get to sit there. And I get the, I, I get the job, my first audition. So, so that changes how, how that, that's one of those moments where the people that, were, that, that you thought you needed, all of a sudden start looking at you like you're the person that they need. Like, they, whoa. And that changes, the, that's like step one in the, the changing of the business dynamic. You know, the second you can identify that you're good at something and you can actually do it, because there's just not everybody can do it. People think they can. And yeah, you could work your way into it if you really want to, but only, a certain, only certain people are gonna be able to do it. Just like only certain people are gonna be able to hit baseballs, or it's just the way it is. So the second you learn that, you know, that's an important thing. That's an important thing for a young artist to, to, to wrap their head around. The second you know that, you, that's step one in your ability to control the situation. Knowing your value. Yeah, knowing your value and knowing now at that point that they can't devalue you. And if they try, they're just bullshitting you because you know how valuable you are, mm -hmm. to them at least. And should be to yourself, of course. Right. But. So as you book the first, you know, commercial, and even your first gig, do you remember that day, getting on set? I had no idea what the fuck I was doing. When they put me on set, I had no, they were all these, they were doing what you guys were just doing before and I had no clue what anyone was doing. It frustrated the, it frustrated the crew so badly, but I was just a kid. They, they were frustrated, but they weren't frustrated with me. They were frustrated with the situation. 
But yeah, so then that, I actually, that same production company hired me to do a couple other commercials. But then I, um, but then I started going on. I got an agent very quickly, a good agent, very quickly after that. Not, not like top level, but in New York City, a good, solid agent. And um, I started going out on, on real auditions for real films and real television programs. And I was working my tail off, you know, studying and getting really good feedback and getting callbacks. And then I, I booked a film in Los Angeles and a uh, very small part in a film called Gattaca. And I played like a young, it was Lauren Dean and Ethan Hawke were the leads. And another, gen, another gentleman and I were playing uh, the younger versions of them in that film. It's a good film actually. Um, and then, so that was my first trip out to LA. So I put me up in a hotel in Beverly Hills and I'm a rental car. I'm like, man. And so that's when I realized what that, how the magic was made. About, yeah. about like a thousand really, really smart people. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Now, financially, how things are going at this time, you're booking these gigs, you may be seeing more money than you have in the past. I mean, I was waiting tables in New York City and then the commercial, not only did I get paid to do the commercial, but a lot of times the commercial, you'll film the commercial and you'll never see the light of day. You don't get paid any money for those commercials. Wow. But if the commercial got shows, you can make a pretty good living off each individual advertisement spot. So that Frosted Flake spot ran. So I got made some pretty good money off that that year. Were you kind of like already kind of financially savvy or did that even take No, I'm just, I've never been financially savvy. So no. how did it take a, so it took like its own, was that like a, how do I express, was that something you kind of like had to figure out or was it just like, um, was part of the business? Well, you know, part of the, listen, I don't know if this happens to everyone, and I love my manager, but when I started to make, I started to make, not real money, but more money, I quit waiting tables, I, I did a film, I did a pilot, I did another film, and I was living in, in, William, in Williamsburg, but at the time, in 1994 or 95, when I was living in Williamsburg, it was not the Williamsburg of today. Like, my rent was $275 a month. Wrap your head around that one. <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. So, I mean, I mean, I, so, so I guess financially I was set because, I mean, not set, but I mean, I was stable because I didn't come from anything. I didn't spend any money. I didn't buy anything. I didn't have much overhead. You know, so everything was pretty cool in my world. So, we, we're doing auditions. Um, you're getting better, I'm sure, with the craft, um, acting. At what point... Do we eventually get to the Steve Harvey show? Was that early in your career? Was that like That's early. Like probably two years after I, maybe a year and a half after I started in the business. So wow. I did like a, I did the, the a couple of films and a couple of pilots for W for the Warner Brothers Network at the time. So I was on their radar already. I but I didn't know this. This is another thing about the business, you know. Once you're on certain people's radar, then they're more comfortable hiring you because they know what you know. They know how you're going to present yourself. So. About a year and a half into that, into starting my acting career, um, I was working with another a woman, I, uh, my acting coach at the time, Davina McFadden, and she's also an actress. She was in, uh, she was in a really great HBO film called A Stranger Inside. It won a bunch about about female prisoners. Okay. It was really a good movie, and she she was the she was the lead in that, and she she really really taught me the rhythms of sitcom comedy and how to audition and, and um, she's a powerful black woman. You know, she just taught me a lot about myself. And so when the, the opportunity to work on the Steve Harvey show presented itself, I felt really comfortable, like walking into that audition and going, yeah, I could, I could, I could probably play this part. But when I went into the meeting, I, met, I went and met with Stan Lathan who's the executive producer and the director of all the episodes. Just a, absolutely phenomenal. That's, he's one of the smartest guys I've ever met in Hollywood. He, uh, he sat me down and we started talking. And I just, at the time, I mean, I, I just really didn't like white guys acting like black guys. Like, I mean, it just really bothered me. Like, kind of see, I just didn't like it. Is it just because uh, it, it just seems so fake to me. York? Just be yourself. I mean, just right. be who, you know, you be comfortable with who you are. Don't, don't try and fit in by, act. don't, just be yourself. Hey, hey, I know some white guys who grew up with all black guys, and that's the, if they act like that's themselves. Right. I'm not saying all guys. Right. I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I know some right. dudes that are, yeah, but there are so many of them. 
from the suburbs that are doing this. And I mean, not, not, maybe not now. I don't want to judge anybody. I don't care what they do. Right. People do whatever they want. But in like when it, back in the day, it just, seems, it just seemed like a bit much to me. I mean, I just didn't like it. Is that how you... They were that's how I thought that... No, that's not what they were telling me, but that's what I perceived the character to be. So I was like, I just kind of went in there with a little bit of an attitude. Mm -hmm. Like, that was always me anyway. Kind of a little bit of chip on my shoulder. I'm short. I'm Irish. Like, just... <laughs> just kind of... <laughs> but I'm big on the inside. That's what, that's what I... I'm like a chicken hawk. <laughs> so... Uh, an audition and... And I, I went in there and um, I just said, look, man, I just, I got no interest in wearing, like, just, I got no interest pretending to be somebody I'm not. I, if you want this guy to be a guy who was raised in Chicago and raised in a trailer park, and, and then he's going to act like this. He's not going to act like that. There's just no way. He wouldn't act like that. And Stan starts laughing. It's like, all right, whatever. <laughs> and, then, and then I left and he gave me the job. Awesome. Cause I think he really liked. I think Stan really liked that. Cause at the end of the day, dude, they never asked me to ever to ever portray that character. No, they never asked me to portray that character in any way aside from the way that I was p playing the character. Right. Yeah. So you get a call, or did your agent let you know that you landed the role? I was like, I was living in Brooklyn at the time, and they called me up. And they said, they had, listen, I don't know wh why it happened. They'd hired someone else. A, another kid played my role in the pilot. But for some reason, that didn't, it just didn't work out. And they replaced that kid with me in the show. And the show had been picked up. So they, I didn't know any of this processes. You know, I didn't know how hard it was for a pilot to get picked up to begin with. I just thought, oh, pilot, 13 episodes, let's go. You know, I mean... <laughs> That's not the way. I've filmed a lot more pilots since then, and none of them have gone to 13 oh. episodes. <laughs> like, no, but so they called me up, and I was in Brooklyn, and they said, uh, you got to move to Los Angeles in 12 hours. So I told my roommate I'll pay rent for the next few months, but I got I to gotta go. And I packed up all my shit and moved to L.A. <laughs> like, like that was a sitcom, that whole scene. <laughs> that was... Was that your first time back to L.A. after that? That was my first time back to L.A. since filming that film. Yeah. And what's overtaking you? As far as like a young actor, you just booked a show. I'm, f I'm afraid. Mm. I'm scared. Never done. I'm not, the, the, the pressure starts to build. Is it the fear of like losing it? Fear of losing the job. They fired the kid that, that I took the job from. I was like, that started to sink in. I'd never done any comedy before. Mm -hmm. Just working with, I used to watch Showtime at the Apollo in my apartment when I was a kid, and I loved Steve, and I was, and I loved uh, Cedric because he hosted his, he hosted uh, he hosted the comedy show that was on, I think on on BET. Okay, Comedy View. Yeah, I loved him. So I mean, I was just, I was, and then I just was a little nervous. I was very, I'm very nervous. Yeah. yeah. As far as like with Steve and Cedric, you knew who they were going into. I did. Them. Yeah. And so what was your first kind of interaction with Steve? I mean, he's a bigger than life man. So, I mean, he's, he's probably a foot taller than I am. You know what I mean? So I was, he's a lot bigger and it was just, so I, he wore those at the time was wearing those awesome suits. Those, awesome. those suits were awesome. <laughs> Come on, he knows they were awesome. Yeah. Steve's uh, fashion sense has changed throughout the years. We all know. He's been a leader in that, actually, I think. I mean, look at him now. He looks awesome. His fashion sense has definitely changed. Yeah. And yeah. so we meet Steve, and, and he's this larger-than-life figure. Okay. Yeah. Now the role of Bullethead. Was that the character's original name? Yeah, that was the character's original name. Yeah. And his storyline was that his grandmother had accidentally shot him in the head with a shotgun. And that the bullet was lodged in his head. Okay. It was kind of like a classic, you know, Woody from Cheers or... You know, the, all these sitcoms had a character that was, you know, kind of a knucklehead. Yeah. Comer Pyle, yeah. kind of a, you know... 
Um, Cole and Martin. Yeah, exactly. Uh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I really like playing. I love the idea of playing the guy that had no idea what was going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I embraced it. But I had no idea what I was doing. There was no character. I, I was flying by the seat of my pants every single first, the first season. I, I thought I was, I never thought I was performing well. I always thought I was stiff. I always thought I was, what I was doing was wrong. When the audience would laugh, I always felt like, the sign went up to say laugh. And, I mean, it just it didn't feel comfortable. It didn't feel right. And then, and then see, and then we got, and then, you know, two of the girls got released, and we Merlin and I didn't. And we kind of like, it was the second time I got that sense, like with this, like, oh, they need us. Yeah. They don't need us, but they like us. Like we're gonna be all right. You know, it's gonna be okay. At least they weren't gonna fire me and you know Merlin. Now you mentioned Merlin. Yeah. Santana. He played Romeo. Mm-hmm. He was your right hand man. Well, I was his right hand man. It was Merlin. Merlin was the, Merlin was the Merlin was the leader. I was I was like I always felt like my character was always walking around going, Why is this guy like hanging out with me? <laughs> and then we became really good. I kind of feel like our friendship on camera became more realistic. Merlin was such a good at Merlin was so talented that when I first got there, he just looked at me like, oh, I got to be friends with the white kid on camera. Okay. Like, like it was a job. Merlin was so job. Like he, could, he could do any, like Merlin could be over here doing one thing. They could give him lines and Merlin could walk in here and just do it. Exactly. Any character, any voice, he could change from being street or hood to being looking like he worked on Wall Street. I mean, Merlin could do anything. Do you remember that first conversation you guys ever had? No, not really. It was too long ago. We immediately, he's from, he's a Dominican, Dominican kid from New York. I lived in a Dominican neighborhood at the time. Williamsburg was a Dominican neighborhood. And uh, I mean, we got along. I, I, I felt like I knew this kid so well. And another thing, I wanted to, when I lived in Williamsburg, I wanted to sort of not hang out with them, but I wanted to, I mean, the guys that were in the, in the neighborhood, the Dominican dudes were way cooler than, I mean, at least they seemed way cooler than we were. And they knew, I mean, we kind of wanted to be like them a little bit. So when my character got to hang out with a guy like Merlin in the show, I was like, this is awesome. I was like, this is going to go over so well back home. I was like, I'm going to be a hero in the, and, and, and I was like. <laughs> so, this is all, this is all happening, right? Now you're filming, you're going through these different seasons. Uh, did the character kind of develop? Oh time? yeah. As you become comfortable in front of the camera, then your comic, your comic timing develops, your, your, your rhythm develops, your, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's crazy what happens. Once you get comfortable, it's like anything. It's like anything, you, what, when you started interviewing people, you were probably a little bit, now you're like, this is what I do. I mean, it, that, you get comfortable. And that's when the comedy gets really good. The Steve Harvey show, like season three, season four, I, we were, we had control, I, Steven said, understood this from the get-go, but that's when I realized that I could work the audience. Like, I could work laughs, I could, I could be, I could play comedy, I can do the... You ever thought about stand-up? I would, I think about it all the time, but I have such a high respect for stand-ups and, and the craft that they work and how hard it is to do it. They make, they, they work material, they write constantly. And then they go up on stage, and when they're really good, they make it look like they didn't. They they thought of it right there on the spot. And that to me, I have so much respect for that. Do I think I could be real? Do I think I'd be really good at it? Yeah, I do. I real. I do think I would be. But I also, um, I don't want to disrespect the young comedians that working their asses off doing it. Like I don't think I could start doing that now. I mean, I just I, mean, I think they'd look at me like I was a. I'd be like Rodney Dangerfield you know, <laughs> coming in from the car insurance salesman job to work some time. <laughs> like, now, as far as, okay, we would see this character develop. Bullethead for some was kind of like the character was a klutz a little bit. He was aloof. With the character, did you see any, like, backlash as you kind of, like, went on to different seasons? Was anyone giving you, like, a hard time? No. Yeah. No. No, I I think people I I really I enjoyed the character. I think a lot of people did. I, I don't. I, I, because I think I was super authentic. I mean, I don't think I because I don't think anybody caught any hint of me trying to trying to fit in, or or that I didn't. Mm-hmm. You know, tried to be as organic as possible. Was it easy for 
you? Was, then we were like a family, though. At this point, I mean, at this point, like a family. Yeah. The cast is predominantly you know, some all black cast. Mm -hmm. um, I think Lori Beth was maybe the other. Yeah, white she cast. Remember, yep. was. Yep. Was other people? No. I mean, there were. Was that? Though? I mean, like I said, I grew up where I grew up in the middle of nowhere. Steve said something funny to me when I first started, like the first season. <laughs> He walks up to me, he just puts me, we were like doing a live show, he puts his hand on my shoulders and he just looks at me and goes, he goes, man, you don't even know what you are, do you? <laughs> and I go, no. I don't, I don't, first of all, I didn't really know what it meant. Now I know what it meant. What he he kind of meant like, man, you don't, you don't care that you're here. Which kind of freaks me out a little bit because I was like, man, does Steve, I wonder if Steve thinks certain people that are here are like, man, I don't want to be here. You know? I was like, man, I would die to be here. <laughs> I don't want to be anywhere else. <laughs> but, but I mean, like we were, a, we were one of the only black sitcoms on the show. All of our, I mean, all the executives are all white. Mm -hmm. I, I do feel like at some, I do feel like sometimes, the, sometimes at the end of the season, each season, there would be this intense feeling of, so... All those dudes upstairs going to tell us we can keep doing this? Or are they going to tell us we got to pack it up and roll out of here, you know? So, and that, that was kind of weird. You know, they, that environment was weird. So, there was a point, you know, where you're doing this character over and over. Does it get to a point for you or did it get to a point where you were ready to maybe move on? Well, I was ready to move on. And um, I was one of the... I got, I, was, I got to do films while we were doing that show. Okay. So I got to really see what else was out there. Mm. I, I didn't have to do as much work on the show as some of the other characters. They could easily just, they could, and Stan, I don't know, I think they thought it was, Stan didn't want to hold me back. So I booked some really good films and I got to go do them. I did October Sky, I mean, it was a big, good film and they let me go do that. They let me fly back and forth between Tennessee and Los Angeles and let me do both jobs at the same time. I mean, that's, that's not common in the television world where they let you do that. Mm -hmm. So what's happening in terms of the business component when you're, now you might be looking at transitioning from sitcom to film. Yeah, that's what I was doing. And then, uh, but, but, but I got a contractual obligation to stay on the show. And I love the show and I mean, my work was consistent throughout the entire thing. I mean, I don't think anybody would ever say, I don't think I ever gave off the impression that I didn't want to be there or that that wasn't the best job in the world. And in retrospect, that's the best job in the world. That was the best job anyone could ever ask for. Yeah. yeah. As far as um, your personal life, how was like your dating life and like maybe one of the family, how was that played with all these? You know, I met my wife when I was very young. I was 24, she was 21. So by, t I think by the time, by, by two years of living in Los Angeles, I was living with my, I was living with the wo woman I'm now married to. Wow. And we've got two kids. And I, so my dating life has been my marriage to my, my life with my wife. Right. And you met her on set? No, I met her on the set of Gone in 60 Seconds. Got you. But then Steve and Steve, everybody really liked her. And we were going to film an episode of our show and we were a Universal sh Studio show at the time. And uh, we were going to uh, Universal Studios in Orlando to film like an on location episode. And they hired my wife to, to uh, or then girlfriend at the time, to play my girlfriend on the show. And so she got to travel to, I mean, that's just so awesome. They didn't have to hire my girlfriend at the time to, play my, and go travel on, on the Universal jet to go fly to Orlando. I mean, it was awesome. You know, it was a very cool experience. It definitely made me look cool. So how did, so now that that was already, you have a foundation with your love life and then your career is now kind of taking in other places. What were some of your goals then now? Like, was it, I need to become this big movie star? And if so, like, who was the actor? I didn't, movie? see, this is what I, we were discussing earlier about my decision making. At the time, I really thought that I knew what I wanted and that I knew the direction that I needed to go in to get to where I wanted to be. And I may have had two or three of those things correct, but I didn't have the entire, I didn't have the, the, whole, the whole set, the whole hand of cards. I just didn't have the information. 
And what I thought I knew, I didn't know, which is worse than not knowing. When you think you know something, you don't know. So I turned down a couple of jobs, television jobs that weren't, that were really stupid to, 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 to join existing shows that were already on, like to just join their cast. I mean, in retrospect, that was a really poor decision not to poor take it. Poor decision in terms of career finance. Career, well, all of the above. Because what I thought, I, I thought it would hold me back from what I wanted to do. It wouldn't have done that at all. It would have opened more doors for me. I would have met more people and I would have honed more skills. I mean, yeah, so no. And, 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 and in 2020 hindsight, no 25 or 26 or 27 year old, unless there's some sort of, you know, I mean, maybe there's exceptions to the rule, but I don't think they should be, you know, just rock solid with their, their thought process, that they're, that they're 100 percent right about what should be happening. You got to listen to the smart people around you. Was no, one, where, I was in no the they stopped around. listening to me because I wasn't listening. So I had these really smart people around me, great agents and managers, and I just wasn't fucking listening. Yeah, stupid. Don't do that, kids. Yeah. No, just listen to the smart people around you. I mean, they're, they're smart for a reason. They're successful for a reason. And then they'll turn you off. They'll stop listening to you and they'll just watch you go down the stream on your raft because they, you don't listen. If you listen, then they'll start moving you in this direction, moving you in that direction. Next thing you know, you've moved your way up the board. Your agents respect you, producers respect you because you listened and you learned along the, along the way. Yeah. That's my, um, that's been uh, my observation of the last, maybe the last five years working with some very big people and kind of seeing how they got to where they got. That they were listening. Kind of listening, kind of easy. Yeah, they didn't think that they knew what they were doing. You know, the days of Robert De Niro telling everybody he was, and by the way, Robert De Niro is like the best actor and the smartest, I mean, I don't, but he was probably telling his, you know, Agent, like, no, I'm doing Godfather 2. You're not going to stop me from doing that. You know what I mean? Whereas I was like, I'm not doing Godfather 2. <laughs> like, you're not going to stop me from doing that. So, what happens after the Steve Harvey show? Did, did the career start kind of moving the way that you planned? Oh, yeah. Totally did. Yep. It totally did. Um, and I got some of the biggest opportunities I've ever had and and they could have gone and they were television opportunities for HBO and they could have gone and it could have just changed the whole trajectory of my life. But that didn't happen. Some things happen in life. But it, they, like like the, getting the call that you got the job on the Steve Harvey show. Yes, that's a life changing experience for the good. And it's super positive and it's great. And it's but then. Other things can like other things can happen that can change the tra trajectory of your life, and they're not so good. And you can't stop them from happening. Yeah, there's nothing you can do. You just gotta weather it. Is that like dealing with family and people like, losing life, like death? Yeah. 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 No, not just death, but real loss. Yeah. It was just hard. It was just hard to kind of recover yeah. from that. Yeah. Care to give us context? No. Yeah. But uh, but things can you know yeah, they can happen. Yeah. Okay. We yeah. <sighs> Sorry about that, guys. Yeah. But. You can get back to your life, you know, you just gotta, you get through it and then you get back to your life and you move on and that's the way life goes. You know, people are probably gonna be watching this that are experiencing, either they just experienced it, yeah. or they have, or they may in the future. Yeah. Like what is that sound advice, or that, that message that you will want someone to know given what you've been through? Well, you just gotta, you have to be, you know, you gotta be able to, uh, you gotta be able to process the negative things that happen in your life. You gotta be able to move through them and, and process them and digest them and get past them. Otherwise, you're gonna carry them around for the rest of your life. And you know, I'm Irish, so the tears are closer to the surface, but that doesn't mean, I mean, I, can't, I just can't think about certain, I can't think about certain things without, um, 
without you know being brought to emotions because those that those chapters of my life were extreme. They also piggybacked a, a writer strike in Los Angeles, and you know, so I mean, there were just there wasn't as much work at that time. And then I had some, you know, like we were talked about Which year, probably 2009, 2010. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, and then I left. I left Los Angeles, and I left the business for probably five or six years. And I'm now just starting to get back into it, you know, slowly. I want to touch back a little bit more on the Steve Harvey role in, in that space, real quick. Um, did Steve ever give you any, any advice? Oh yeah, Steve's given me tremendous advice. Steve's really, Steve's really good at giving. He likes to give people advice, <laughs> and he's good at it. <laughs> So yeah. Um, you know, prob probably the probably the best advice Steve ever gave me was to be careful who you trust. Mm. Yeah. Just anyone. Mostly people in Hollywood. Okay. Just be careful who you actually put your trust in. Not that there are not very trustworthy people in Hollywood, but just be very careful who you trust with your money, with your time, you know, did you observe, with your personal information, you know. Did you observe how he moved? Steve moves in silence. No one, no one really sees what Steve, like, I don't think anybody has ever seen anything, like, business-wise that Steve does. That's why he's so, yeah, he's the boss. As far as, um, in 2002, uh, we would lose Merlin Santana. Yeah. Yeah, Terry called me. Yeah. yeah. You know, I got to be honest with you. I was not 100% surprised okay. when I heard Merlin had passed away. The way that or, he passed? Or, no, that he had passed or the, or the fashion or the circumstances. I was not surprised. I'm, I'm just, Merlin lived a, Merlin was a wild dude. Mm -hmm. He was super talented, but he was wild. And he was not... You couldn't tell him what to do. You couldn't tell him where to go. He wasn't afraid of anyone or anything to, to a fault, you know. Got him killed at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. yeah. To the point where, I mean, I love Merlin, but, and we were, we, were, we were so close. That relationship that you saw on camera was absolutely authentic. If, if, I, if it wasn't for my wife, I probably would have spent a lot more time hanging out with Merlin. And my wife loved Merlin, and Merlin loved my wife. But my wife's like, you're not hanging out with him. <laughs> it's like... You can't no. <laughs> she wouldn't let me. Um, I mean, Merlin was, you know. What do you think he would have been doing now? I kind of always saw Merlin as being, like, he would have been a, this massive crossover star. He was an incredible reggaeton, like, rapper. At the time, that music was very popular. And he was cutting an album with Big Pun at the time. I mean, I'm, I'm aging. I'm dating myself at this time. But, but... These guys were recording albums to get, I mean, and he was really, normally I'd be like, Merlin, this is horrible. <laughs> but it was good. He was really talented. And he was like, yoked and like, he was good with like, you know, he, he could have probably been like a rapping action. You know, I mean, what would have stopped him, right? I mean, was, he could have been like a mix between like a Will Smith and like a, you know. You think um, Ice Cube, you know, he does all the movies and stuff, you know. What was happening in his career when you transitioned? He was starting to do film. Yeah. Yep. I mean, they, oh yeah, dude, Merlin was going to go. The only problem with Merlin was people were, you know, a little bit put off with how wild Merlin was. They, you say they knew. Wild, is that like in terms of like. You didn't know what time he was coming home. You didn't know who he was going to get into a fight with. You just didn't, you know, just to, he, you couldn't tell him what to do, where to go. I mean, I don't think I'm, I'm not saying anything that. Anybody that knows Merlin wouldn't agree with me. I guarantee you Terry would say the same. Everybody, they would all say the same thing. And I loved him like a brother, but he ran. He was fast, man. He was, I mean, look up the details of his, his passing. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like something out of, a, you know, like a, like a film. Yeah. Something that would happen in a movie. Not something that happens to a person in real life. So, not like Merlin, not someone like Merlin. No, no, no. You know what I mean? That happens to people in real life every day. But I mean, not guys like Merlin. How did it, how did that impact you? Did it make you think about your own 
It just saddened me. It just made me so upset that such a waste of talent. He could have controlled that. Maybe he couldn't have. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Do you think, did he have anybody around him that, actually, that was, was he on the path of not listening when you were speaking? He on? was, we were, we were uh, both ninjas in the same shadow society. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we did not like people telling us what to do at the time. Not cool. Yeah. Could have used some advice. Mm. Steve tried really hard with Merlin, and it's a very sensitive subject with him, one that probably he doesn't even want to discuss or talk about. I never think about that because Steve does, yeah, I can see Steve being right there and him seeing Merlin. And Are you kidding me? Steve saw, the, Steve saw the whole, Steve saw it all. So... And Steve tried really hard, but side. yeah, but still, but every time Steve, I mean, this is, I mean, I was front and center for it. So I'll just, I mean, every time Steve tried, I saw Merlin go, nah, man. You know, he just, he, his ears were off. He was not listening. Do you think if he would have listened to Steve? Maybe <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. Right. But at the same time, I mean, maybe Steve's approach or timing might have been a little off. I think. I think Steve probably, and that's why he doesn't want to talk about it. Because in the back of his head, he's like, "What? How did that? How did that? How did that happen on my like? How did that happen to one of my peeps?" Yeah. On my watch. I don't know, man. I don't even. I, I'm probably speaking out of turn right now by saying that. You know, I don't even like. Like I said, like yeah, I don't. Um. Like I said, I don't want to say anything about do you Steve. You know now. why this show came to an end? Like I said, we ran out of our contract, and we're gonna renew a show about. <laughs> I was 28. <laughs> Merlin was like 27. We've been seniors in high school for seven years. <laughs> With like, Merlin's covered in tattoos. <laughs> like, that's kind of like... Do you um, still keep in touch with some of the people? Too? Yeah, I saw Seth a, a few months ago. I worked, I did an episode of his sitcom. How was that? That was awesome. But, but, the days of like f making comedy in a free environment in a soundstage studio, those days are over. I mean, it was very complicated to be funny with everybody so stressed out about COVID. I mean, and that's realistic. I mean, just the map, the protocols to, are not funny. Like, they're just not. Very hard for anybody to be funny when they're wearing a face shield and three masks. And then right before they roll, can no one said to choke. You're doing network run-throughs on Zoom screens. I mean, it's just, it's not conducive for the funny environment. And you can tell some of the people that are really funny, it dampens them. It's like putting a ratch, ratch, ratcheting them down, you know? So at one point, just to kind of walk us through what you've done, rural town, New York, movie in LA, you come back, you get an audition for the Steve Harvey show, go to LA, do the Steve Harvey show, do a phenomenal job with the character, and then you start doing movies. Mm -hmm. And your visibility is out there. But well, what was the turning point? And you mentioned this earlier. Why did we stop seeing you a little bit less? Why didn't the momentum carry on? Circumstances happen inside of the framework of our family. Mm -hmm. And the type of family that we are, it, the, the idea of managing said situation from Los Angeles when the situation is in another state and requires all your time and emotion, you know. So you just, so you, you, you gotta, gotta go. go, you gotta go, you gotta, 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 gotta cut and run. And uh, that's tough, but there's, there's choices in life that you have to make, you know, what do you do? Right. You know, what do you, what, right. you know? Yeah. There's certain, no, 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 I, I know people that, are, that why'd you do that? Mm. Okay, well you and I aren't the same. Right. We're different types of people. Right. Yeah. Cause I was gonna say that clearly showed me way for values are my wife is the type of woman where if she tells me what to do I do it because that's how it works and I like that that's how it rolls mm -hmm. as far as um, speaking of marriage what has marriage taught you or what did it teach you what's it retaught me <laughs> everything <laughs> taught me how to be selfless you know taught me all this all this stuff that and it's real Taught, taught you how to care about someone. Actors are inherently narcissistic. All performers, they just are. Narcissism is like a vicious thing. 
when you're an artist, it can be managed. You can, you know, you're a narcissist, so you can sort of work your narcissist. You can work it. You can make it happen. I feel bad for people that are like somebody who works in sales that's a narcissist. What a fuck that guy is, you know? Or, I, but so, sorry, I lost my train of thought. We were talking about what the marriage. Teaches. Oh yeah, no, the narciss the, the narcissism aspect of it. So you have to strip yourself of nar narcissism in order to be a good parent and a good husband. You just you have to. So as an actor, you've got to be able to. It takes away from your ability to be a good actor, but you got to do. You have to do it, or you can't be a good husband or father. You can't. You're just gonna go on location and fuck. Her. I mean, I'm not speaking. I don't. I'm not giving up any of the like. But this is what happens. This is what people do. They're either they either don't do that or they do that. There's two types. Of, there's only two types of people. There's good fathers, good husband actors, and then there's the other people. <laughs> That's just the way it is. Now, as far as um, you and your wife will go on and begin to have children, what has children taught you? Same question. Oh, my children, man, they taught me everything. I mean, well, this is what I mean. They taught me everything about modern society. Like, I didn't, I don't, my kids are my professors now. They teach, I don't have any, my kids, edit my 16-year-old my edits my audition tapes because I have no idea how to work my phone. My 13-year-old had taught me all about this uh, gender situation going on. No, taught me, they laid the whole thing down on me. I was like, I was like, what's, what's going on? He's like, Dad, this is what's, and so I was like, they're my, they're my teachers. Like, I don't know anything about the world that they're in. I didn't grow up in the world that they're in. They're in a completely foreign world to me. A child in this world, fuck, I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know what they're doing. How do your children uh, reflect on your career? They don't care. They don't, they don't. Yeah. Yeah. Dad, when are you gonna get another acting job? <laughs> Dad, when are you gonna get they don't care. <laughs> as far as- You used to be cool, Dad. Oh, I get that a lot. <laughs> No, his friends at school will see something. Or like the funny thing happened the other day. Well, not the other day, but during COVID. My son's like, ugh. My 16 year old's like, gotta wash this. They're, you know, the, last year was totally useless. My kids literally laid in bed in homeroom, playing on their phones while some teacher was talking. I mean, it was just, it wasn't school, man. So my kids got science class. He goes, Dad, go watch some stupid movie. I'm like, well, yeah, what do you gotta watch? It's like, Gat, you're Gattaca? I'm like, I don't know, sounds good, enjoy it. And he goes in there and like 20 minutes later, Dad! He's <laughs> like, why don't you tell me you were in this movie? All my friends are calling me from school, your dad's in this movie. I'm like, so that, that happens every once in a while, but not very often. My kids are not that impressed. Okay, now you would mention, um, do you want your kids to be in show business or are you just kind of let no. them do their thing? But they can do whatever they want. But do I want, I would never let them be in show business as, as children. Wow. Never. Wow. Because I wouldn't do that. Oh. <laughs> 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 that me everything. Yeah. There. Um, so ultimately you make a big decision to step away. Yeah. And now you can come back. Yeah. Why? Why are we I don't know how to do anything else. But it's been, it's been, the business has changed, you know. How do you feel it's changed in a good or? No, it's just technology's changed. It, it's been, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad, it's happened. I mean, you know, they just, I'm glad these lights aren't as hot as they used to be. That's a good thing. Like, right. that's a new advancement in film technology. So what does the, what does the goal look like now, given the fact that when you first started, is the goal, has the goal changed? Um, you know, no, the goals haven't changed. No, I still want to do, I, I am never more happy than when I'm, aside from my, you know, when I'm with my family, stuff, but this is such a true statement. When you're working, when you're doing what you love to do, it's a feeling, it's, it's there's no better feeling in the world than like doing what you want to do, be doing and you're good at it and someone's paying you. It's the best feeling in the world. So yeah. it's, hard, it's hard to do anything else once you've experienced that. What do you like about acting? I'm just good at it, you know, so I like to do it because it's easy for me. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I'm just, it comes naturally to me and I enjoy it. I, loved, I love the interaction. I, I don't know, I like the whole process. 
I like the whole process. I like, um, I like everybody in every department. I always have. I find myself kind of, I've learned so much about every, I think I know a lot about the process because I've spent so much time engaging with so many different people from so many different walks of life and different jobs. Yeah. Right. yeah. So in terms of, as you look back on your career, what would you kind of like, how do you define it? If it had a name, if it, how would you look back in your story itself? I think I'm one of those, oh, I know that guy. Guys, and I'm okay with that. Okay. Yeah, that doesn't bother me. I like that. That's fine. But I think, is it more, is that maybe a new goal to now kind of implement your name? Not so much. I mean, I like, that doesn't matter to me. I don't care. I've done it, you know, like, a lot of that. I did a lot of that. <laughs> I've experienced a lot of that. Mm -hmm. So that part of it is not that interesting to me. I like the, the work and the, the, what you do and what you get paid in this business is good. The work to pay ratio is good. You get paid to do what you do. And if do you, you like feel it. like, um, and this is touching on the character of, Oh, well, yeah, this is, do you feel that that is your biggest role, at least that people know you from? I mean, it depends on what town you're in, okay. you know? If I'm in Memphis, Tennessee, yeah. <laughs> but if I'm in, if I'm in, uh, you know, if Nashville. I'm in, no, if I'm in Nashville, they're going to know me from October Sky. They're going to know me from Butterfly Effect. They're going to know me from, from, from other jobs. They're not going to know, they're, not, they're probably not going to have ever seen that show. Whereas in the black community, I'm they know me. I'm known. So and that's we, awesome. That's been such a great thing. We just interviewed um, Christopher B. Duncan. Yeah. Who played Braxton on the Jamie Foxx show. Yeah, yeah, we were talking about that. And he somewhat highlighted the negative part of kind of excelling in a particular role um, where he played the character Braxton. Braxton was kind of pompous. Yeah. And he talked about when he walks in some auditions and the directors and producers automatically, oh, Braxton. Yeah. Do you relate to that? Have you feel like, have you done anything to make people not? I feel like the character of Butterfly Effect, I mean, the character of, of uh, Bullet had made, reflected on, on me like I, because I had done so many other different types of roles. They're like, oh, this dude can just do fucking anything. This guy can work in. So it kind of made it, it, was, it had the opposite effect. You know what I mean? It didn't pigeonhole me at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in closing, this this is more so just trying to highlight who you were, or who you are, because people again got to see you and they may not have known your story. Um, what does the word unforgotten mean when you think about that? Being someone that is unforgotten. You know. It didn't even cross my mind until I read it when you sent me the questions. Mm -hmm. And I really, really liked that. I really thought, man, I really want, I really want, I would really very much like that. That's what that made me feel. Yeah. Kind of gave me this sense of like, yeah, I would very much like to be unforgotten. If yeah. I'm forgotten, so be it. But I would very much like not to be. Yeah, all the work that you did. Or just, I like the idea of people <laughs> remembering what I did and who I am. Yeah. Yeah. I do, I do, I do like that. I do. And I hadn't thought about it, so I appreciate that because it gives some, yeah. it gives some meaning to the whole, you know, you not that there isn't, but it just gives it, you know, yeah. yeah, encapsulates the whole thing. Yeah, you're definitely unforgotten. Yeah, which is it's cool. You want to talk to you. You know, you were someone that was able to take a character, at least in our community, and create a, a, a pinpoint that we won't ever ultimately forget. Yeah. So well, that's, that's awesome. That's a, a when I tell people that, like that, that are part of the series, I think that's like somewhat of the accomplishment is that yeah. you did such a great job that you're implementing people. Well, lives. you invited me here, which is awesome. You know what I mean? Like so, yeah. So you just let me, you know, let me come tell the story is is worth it in itself. You know. Um, just looking back, we talked about a lot. Of the life is about decisions. Was there any major regret that you have with how you played this game of the business, life? And just, I can't preface this enough. Just listening when you're young and you're talented and you're coming up, don't, 
don't think you're the don't think everyone's out to get you and don't think that's the people that are around you aren't there to help you and just because they're making a lot of money off of you doesn't mean that that isn't a really good thing and that they they want to it's just it's a it's product investment and it has a, if you are a, a smart invested like engaged young artist and you listen to those smart business people around you the marketing aspect of it and the direction that you that they lead you in you just become a, a really fu a well functioning team you know that's just it's, i can't preface that enough that would be the one piece of advice that i would give a young artist today regardless of what medium they're in that would be my advice find smart people and don't necessarily and you know don't take their word for law but you know take their advice well Mr. William D. Scott. Thank you. This is your first Unforgotten with Comedy Hike. Thanks, guys. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Awesome. And that is a wrap.